Uh, well, thank you all for coming. I'm very excited um, to be speaking to everyone today around App Store optimization. Um, so again, really appreciate uh, you all coming out. Hopefully, if you're in this room, that's because you already know something about App Store optimization and why it might be important for you. Um, but we did bring together a panel of experts uh, to kind of ho hopefully highlight even uh, why you should probably be thinking about it more so. So well, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves. But um, to start with, I'm Steve DeAngelis. I'm VP of Americas at Evan Sachi Mobile, uh, kind of oversee the uh, US part of the agency. Uh, but on the panel today, I'm going to turn it over to Adam to introduce himself. Thanks, Steve. Uh, it's really wonderful being here. And we're excited to share uh, our ASO wisdom. I'm uh, Adam Rakib, founder of StoreMaven. We're uh, one of the leading platforms for testing App Store creatives on both the App Store and Google Play. And we work with uh, great folks here like uh, MC Sachi and, uh, and Amazon to test those different creatives like the icon, title, screenshots, et cetera, uh, for more conversions to get more people to download your apps. Excellent. And Peter? Hi, right, I'm Peter. Um, I'm a co-lead at MC Sachi, developing the ASO department. Uh, we've been specializing in the area for, for about two years now. Um, we provide support in areas uh, starting from keyword optimizations to creator optimizations, um, as well as review and rating sentiment as well. And last but not least, Bolong. And uh, I'm Bolong, and uh, I'm from uh, Audible. Uh, Audible is an uh, uh, Amazon company, and we run audiobook business. And uh, I had our conversion team. And I'm personally, I personally actually have a focus on uh, mobile apps and uh, mobile app store optimization. It's really great to be here. Excellent. Well, uh, I thank all the panelists for participating today. Uh, I know we're going to have a, a quite fruitful discussion. So to start, why don't we, we really just kind of dig into it? Um, and I'd love to kind of get some opinions from all of you around kind of why do you need it? Why is ASO important? Um, so Peter, why don't we start with you? Yeah, um, I think for ASO, there's really two sides to it. One is your discoverability, and your other is conversions. For discoverability, really, it's about your keywords, um, optimizing to your keywords so that users can easily find your product. Um, for conversions, making sure that all the creative elements that are occupying the space in the product page are um, optimized in a way that the users can resonate easily. Um, understand that uh, when they do land on the store, it's the solution that they were looking for, um, this leading to an easier conversion. Got it. And Bolong, do you view ASO in kind of similar terms uh, at Audible, or, or do you look at it slightly different? Uh, I, think, I think we're on the same page. Uh, I think uh, for ASO, from, from our end, we don't actually look at it in the silo. Essentially, app store optimization is part of your entire marketing optimization, because if you think from a customer's perspective, it's all the same. They just choose to lend your service or your page uh, on dif from different places, like App Store or your website. So the website optimization is, is, has already been very, very established and matured. Okay. But App Store is something new. But fundamentally, they're the same. So we should be looking at you know, App Store optimization the same way as we look at web optimization. That's how, it, how we approach it. Absolutely. And Adam, what about you? Does Store Maven look at it any differently, or is there something that these two maybe left out that you wanted to highlight as the importance of ASO? No, I definitely agree and want to echo that analogy. I mean, ASO sounds like something new all of a sudden, but basically it's, it's online marketing. And uh, you have these different aspects. We're driving traffic from different places, uh, driving awareness. We're getting people uh, into this App Store page, which is essentially just the home page of, of your website. And, uh, there's the SEO side, having the right keywords, uh, making sure that we're getting the right audience. And then there's the landing page conversion, uh, landing page optimization, basically making sure you have the right message uh, to get people to, to convert. So pretty yeah, much I mean, the same. I mean, I think it's a good point and maybe overlooked sometimes by brands, right? But your App Store page is, is a branding opportunity. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's an opportunity for you to connect with potentially a, a lot of consumers. So um, certainly should be invested in, I think. Um, OK. so. Maybe next, let's, let's talk a little bit about what is each of your approaches to ASO? How do you really tackle it? Uh, and Bolong, why don't we start with you, uh, as you have obviously a lot of experience on the product side. Sure, sure, no problem. So I think, I think um, as I just mentioned, I think we are looking at this from a more holistic way. 
uh, basically, from a marketing perspective, we do a lot of campaigns, you know, on upper funnel, like TV campaigns, radio campaigns, or display campaigns. And there are just two, two different, there are different surfaces we can actually direct them to. One is website, one is app store. So we view them um, from the same angle to optimize the pages so we can provide the right information so the customer can actually get, get into the next stage. So that's why you know, there are two, um, two things I want to call out. One is the similarity between these two things, uh, which is basically you need to provide the right messaging, the images, the, uh, the selling point, right. and there's the right call to action. So we can leverage a lot of the things we have already learned from the website and apply it on the App Store. And there's also the difference because Unlike the website, you can actually customize your landing page very differently, tailored for di very different traffic. On the App Store, it's one page fits all. So you have to think, just imagine you only have one landing page and one website, but it has to you know, speak to everybody coming from all different sources, what you would do there. So that's basically the, the restriction. So that's also how we actually approach it, like test different things, but you know, make sure that it works for the most of the traffic there. Right. So that's how, I, how we approach it. I mean, it's a really good point. Um, and despite that difficulty, right, of, of only having one message for your entire audience, I'd just be curious, you know, which destination is more successful generally for Audible? Um, you know, do you, do you find driving people to the App Store page versus the website is the right approach, um, or is it the opposite? I, I think it depends. And also, if you think from the customer's perspective, some customers, they prefer to explore things in the App Store, and some they prefer to actually just quickly type in your URL and then just explore what you can offer. So, but we, we are seeing more and more people are actually trying to explore and um, engage us from the very beginning from the App Store. That's why it becomes more and more important, and that's why we want to actually be ready for those people. Got it, yeah. got it. Okay, um, Adam, what about you? How do you kind of approach ISO? So I definitely agree with Bolong that the right approach is more holistic. Um, we'll take, for example, companies that do invest heavily in paid acquisition. Uh, one of the things they, they do is they change promotions all the time. So you have an ad banner, you put it out there, and naturally that content decays and you switch it up. And if you don't sort of understand that there's a very strong connection between the way you promote yourself outside of the store and the way you promote yourself uh, in the App Store page itself, then you're causing a disconnect. And uh, that's something that could definitely damage conversions. And, uh, and, and you know, the more we think of things uh, together as pieces of the puzzle that need to fit, then the better the results are. Excellent. And I'll, I'll throw this one out uh, to the group, so whoever wants to answer. But be curious to know, you know, as part of your approach to App Store optimization, does it involve any um, App Store paid search? Is that part of the equation to see kind of optimal results? Uh, or is that something that isn't of concern? Um, I, I can start. I, I, think, I think from, from you know, our end, I think uh, one thing we utilize paid uh, media to help is basically to speed up our testing uh, pace. So as I mentioned, basically on the App Store, there's only one page you can test things. And then it takes time to actually get there. So the more traffic you can get, the faster you can actually prove certain things or disapprove certain things. That's why sometimes we use paid media to help us to drive more traffic to actually speed up our testing. Um, the other piece is sometimes you, you, you figure out, you know, you have to make sure that the paid and organic needs to work together. For one thing, you know, on the search side, there is the search ads in the App Store, both on Android and iOS, and also there's organic. You have to make sure that they work together. Otherwise, the, the customer experience will be very weird or not the one you want it to be. Absolutely. Kind of harks back to the days of SEM, SEO, kind of working in tandem. Yeah. Um, um, just to add to that, um, from, I guess, very specifically from an ASO perspective, when we're optimizing for keywords, um, Google's algorithm as well as iOS algorithm takes a little bit of time before the keywords do get indexed. And what we found that if you put a little bit of paid effort behind each keyword, then the indexation of those keywords will actually occur faster. Um, and by that, I mean that the ranking of those keywords will increase a little faster. Um, that puts us a little bit ahead so that we don't have to wait until the algorithms naturally um, start indexing for those keywords. Right, and that could be pretty vital, uh, especially if there's some seasonality to your app, right? You might want to test some things so that you're optimized going into the holiday season, for instance. Uh, Adam, did you have anything to add to that? or? Yeah, actually, one of the interesting things we, we recently learned from uh, studying the data on tests that we've run for the new iOS 11 uh, pages is uh, within search, you basically have uh, more apps that are appearing in the new layout. So basically, people are getting distracted away from your app, 
and in a way, we've seen uh, with, with several cases declining uh, rates of uh, organic installs. And I think, I mean, it's, it's increasing the importance of appearing on the top, and search ads is obviously a very effective way of ensuring that you, uh, you're surfaced above the, the rest, and being first is, is always best. Marketing 101, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Peter, maybe a question for you, but is there, is there more data that you get from running uh, App Store paid search ads that you, that you wouldn't normally get in just doing uh, uh, organic? Analytics? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so right now there's a lot of limitations within the App Store platforms. Um, a lot of it is at the keyword level. So unlike SEO, we don't really understand how much traffic we're getting per each keyword or how much installs we're getting at, uh, per each keyword. So in order for us to have some sort of proxy to measure the performance of those specific keywords, we do lean on paid performance to see, okay, what keyword do we need to prioritize for the organic channel? Um, so let's say we run an ad and we understand that brand names are performing better than the product names or competitor names. What we'd essentially want to do is prioritize those in your metadata bank or within your description um, so that it is, um, when the audience does land on the page, they do see those certain keywords. Yeah. Makes sense to me. Um, so I think, you know, in this conversation it's become obvious that keyword optimizations are, are pretty important to ASO. Um, just curious, in your experience, how has that impacted or helped kind of your app install efforts? Uh, Bolong, if you wouldn't mind starting us off. Sure. I, I think um, to us, I think there are two major things. One thing is certainly, um, as Adam and Peter said, the additional traffic we can we can generate from the keywords optimization is definitely something we're, 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 a, we're after because that's basically free traffic and which can be translated into downloads and downstream metrics. Um, so that's why we want to be, as Adam said, on top of the certain keywords that are, that are relevant to our business. That's one thing. And the other thing is, this is there is a super rich data um, in that kind of keywords we can we can leverage you know some of the some of the keywords are resonating with our customers so we under, understand our customers or business better so we can leverage those certain keywords to other channels like our website on our, on our website or TV campaigns so that that can actually be amplified the impact and also for the you know some some of the keywords we generate from the for example read and review which are actually negative, we can use that to help us to identify the things we need to fix or actually to the gaps we need to actually fill. So that also helps us. I mean, that seems really important, right, to call out that ASO can have implications beyond just the app store yep. um, and Absolutely. how you approach marketing. So um, important to keep in mind. Peter, what about yourself? What, what, what have you seen work? Yeah, so I think um, more specific examples for that, um, one of the past projects that we run ran for a live TV streaming app. Um, we were able to uncover seasonality um, insights essentially. Um, they would run, um, we would naturally be ranking for a sporting event like Copa America without us actively trying to actually index for those keywords. So what we discovered is that it's very important for us to keep a pulse on keyword movement um, so we can take advantage of and leverage these keywords that we would naturally index for. And of course, if we start optimizing for that keyword, we would be deemed a little bit more relevant for that keyword, thus hopefully increasing the traffic for those terms. Um, another example is that we would be indexing for terms that may be used for new programs. Um, one of the apps that we ran a project for, we started indexing for the term dyslexia um, without us actually actively trying to index for that term as well. And what's interesting about dyslexia is if you look into that, the audience size is actually quite big. Um, there's roughly about 20 to 40 million people in America with that condition. So for that product, it's interesting because um, we're able to provide a new solution or create a program that may provide a new solution to an audience that we weren't aware of, um, helping, helping them kind of with the product. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. Okay. And Adam, what about you? Yeah, so sort of touching on what Bolong said in terms of understanding the, the implications of uh, your app store page and, and downstream metrics, we, we found that basically the kind of engagement that we see in the app store itself is also an indicator for the quality of the installer. So we'll take a, you know, an example of someone that lands on the page and they start watching the video, uh, or they scroll through the image gallery, they might take a bit more time reading the description. That's someone that really is, is you've had the opportunity of getting them more excited and more informed about the app. And the more excited someone is before they download, uh, the more likely they are to become someone that perhaps you know, uh, registers or uh, does some kind of transaction uh, or even just open the app uh, the first time. Even trying it, that's yeah. a win, right? <laughs> um, really interesting stuff. 
So maybe sticking with you for a moment, Adam. Outside of like adding keywords to the metadata on your App Store page, have you, have you seen any other optimizations work in terms of increasing discoverability within the App Store? Yeah, so um, I, actually I like the, the seasonality um, topic. Uh, we'll, we'll use an example of uh, you know, say an e-commerce company that uh, around Black Friday are trying to optimize for a uh, certain keyword for, for Black Friday, um, say like it is. Uh, and if you could actually incorporate those keywords within screenshots, for example, in the visuals, yeah. then as people scroll through search results, you could draw them in uh, by, uh, by using those visual assets as well. And that's something that uh, has worked. Good to know, yeah. I, the visual elements seem to be a big component as well outside of the keywords, right? Um, okay. So again, we've sort of highlighted the importance of keywords and, and maybe the visual elements as well, but it'd be interesting to kind of better understand how do you guys tackle researching which keywords you want to actually index or rank for? Um, so Peter, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, for sure. Um, so it's different for the stage of your app. I think for newcomers, it's really hard to see where we're currently indexing because that app just doesn't exist in the App Store. Um, so we do lean heavily on competitive research, um, checking where the competitors are indexing for for certain apps, as well as the category, um, making sure that we're using certain terms that are ranking high within the category. Um, of course, if you're an existing app, we can definitely use certain tools that allows us to see uh, what your app is currently ranking for. Um, and then we'll kind of determine relevancy of those certain terms and try to actively optimize towards them, as well as uh, competitive research. And of course, if SEO data is available, um, that, uh, that is also very helpful as well. Interesting, okay. Just to chime, chime, chime in on that, I think another piece, as Adam said, is we work together because um, front end, you may actually identify certain keywords that are working for you in terms of driving traffic, but also you need to follow through to see whether those traffic actually convert into like downloads or even actually trial sign up or membership taken or revenue. Because sometimes, you know, especially for us, because we're sort of right now it's a niche product. So if we, you know, choose the high value or high traffic keywords to drive traffic, it may actually work on the front end because you're seeing more traffic, more downloads, but they may, they may not be the right population you should be targeting at. Right. So that's why it's also important to actually have the full funnel experience and track that. I think it's a really good point. Um, so in thinking about the keywords then, um, and we talked a lot about their, we've, we've had some interesting discoveries, right, that there's seasonality potentially, um, and there's a lot of competition that can kind of crop up out of the blue. So just be curious, you know, do you guys have a general rule for how often you should be performing some sort of keyword audit or keyword research? Um, Peter, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think a good cadence is roughly about once a month. Um, making sure that you're going in and seeing if the keywords that you're optimizing towards is ranking well, um, seeing if you're seeing any drop in rankings or even new, newly ranking keywords, right? And this helps you s catch those seasonality terms. Um, and also in terms of waiting for the indexation usually takes about a month anyway. Um, so a month is a, is a pretty solid um, cadence for measurement. So that was gonna be my next question. Like how long does it take until you maybe see some of the impact of those keyword optimizations? Typically, you're, you're seeing it about a month? Yeah, for Google Play, it's usually about a month. For the App Store, it's a little shorter. Um, the way you actually optimize for keywords is different. For Google Play, they lean heavily on their existing algorithms and how keywords are indexed on their website. Um, for Apple, they have a keyword bank where you actually add your keywords, so they already know certain keywords that you're trying to optimize towards, so that um, takes less time than Google's, um, Google Play's algorithm. And Bolong, is that align kind of what you see in terms of timing, roughly? Yeah, like pretty much. Yeah. And uh, I agree that uh, on the Google side, on the Google Play side, it's it's because they are more sophisticated. So, you know, it takes time to for you to actually get indexed for certain things. But on the app App Store side, because that's very more straightforward. You input your keywords, uh, not only in the bank, but also you know, for example, on the on the subject line, your, your the name of your app, and uh, some of the the first paragraph, your your description, that actually has a very Street for impact. When right. you actually change certain things, it'll just pop. Got it. And harking back to something that you said before, um, <laughs> you know, you, you want to drive qualified traffic to your App Store page, and ultimately you want to look at down funnel metrics such as, you know, they, go, they went on to install, they go on to take a trial. 
has either, have any of you kind of experienced um, any negative repercussions for when you're not driving qualified traffic? So I'm just curious if, if there's ever been any evidence to say like, hey, if I drive a bunch of traffic but they don't actually install my app, the algorithm penalizes our ranking for that keyword. Um, absolutely, I think, so the way the algorithm works is you try to optimize for certain keywords. Um, Google will pick up those keywords and register that for the terms that you're trying to index for. And then the user has to search for it um, and then land on your page and then install your app um, and then also engage with it. Um, when they stop engaging for that app, you will start ranking lower for that search term if, if the users aren't engaging. So there's a natural system built into Google and um, Apple to make sure that the keywords that you're trying to index for is actually the users are coming through and using them. So yeah, there's definitely a um, penalizing type of activity that happens. Interesting. So I mean, even more reason to be monitoring your keywords, right? To make sure that it's actually hopefully yep. driving um, usage. Yep. Great. Yeah, and, and I think, like you said before, search ads is another great tool to actually understand uh, your relevancy for different keywords so you can see how many people click and actually tap into your product page and how many people um, convert. And uh, that's, that's really where the creatives come into play as well, is uh, making sure that you know, as people do find you, the creatives are really pulling them in. Good point, good point. Um, so I mean, I think as marketers, we probably have all experienced, uh, you know, sometimes you have a good idea, whether it's optimization or otherwise, but implementing it can be difficult for various reasons, right? So just curious um, to get your input on, what challenges have you guys faced as you've tried to implement some of these app store optimizations? Uh, and, and Bolong, I think you probably have the most experience kind of be on the product side, so it'd be great to hear your yeah, thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, as I mentioned, it's important to actually measure everything and understand the, 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 the full funnel impact for your changes. But unfortunately, right now, you know, the, the tools or the available uh, metrics are not there yet for app store optimization. For, for me or m marketers to fully understand by changing, sort of, for example, certain keywords, uh, or the things you want you optimize towards, what's the true impact of that? So, for example, if you change certain keywords, you're not 100% sure how much traffic it actually generates for you, right. or how many downloads it actually generates for you, and not to mention the downstream metrics. I think that's the number one challenge for me. It's a pretty big challenge. Yeah, seems like a big miss by somebody. Um, Adam, what about you? Yeah. So, so Bolong mentioned this a bit earlier about like how different audiences will react differently to different product pages. Right. Um, and, and just the fact that the App Store is really a one size fits all, you have to select one page, is very limiting. Um, so for example, with, uh, with, with Audible, uh, you know, if people are searching for some kind of context, like uh, where I'm commuting and I want something to just uh, pass my time, then you know, a landing page with an image showing someone just you know, on the subway with, with the earphones on, that could be a great landing page versus someone that searches for a specific book and then you'd want uh, something that's more personalized to that uh, search experience. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's very challenging to ultimately select just one, especially given that you rely on a lot of different traffic sources. Uh, it could be social, it could be uh, traffic coming from different networks and that's it's a major challenge not to compromise an audience that's very important for you. Do you think Google or Apple will ever get around to allowing you to have multiple App Store landing pages? Anyone here from Google or Apple? In the <laughs> if you're listening, <laughs> powerful suggestion. Yeah, uh, yeah you know, uh, I think things are changing. Um, it's, uh, you know, a couple of years back, there weren't any A-B testing capabilities. Now there's uh, Google Experiments, which is the tool uh, that they have. Um, so, you know, there, there's definitely progress that we're seeing and hopefully uh, down the road, I think you know just the state of things where we're pretty limited in terms of our ability to uh, to lower the cost of acquiring new users. Yeah. There's so much you could do on the traffic side and tar better targeting, better ad creatives, uh, and I think this is an area where there's just huge opportunity. We see it in our own A/B tests with companies having a better product page can convert 10, 20, 30 percent more. Uh, and if we have a more personalized experience, then that's an area that could really disrupt um, acquisition. I mean, absolutely, right? I think if, if you have an App Store page that gets a lot of traffic, you're driving you know, thousands of installs in a week, a uh, slight increase in conversion rate would make all the difference potentially to your business. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Peter, what about you? I think you're, 
uh, being on the agency side, you're probably stuck in the middle sometimes in getting these things implemented. So it'd be good to kind of know what, what hardships have you faced when trying to get some of these optimizations implemented? Yeah, I think ours definitely is the, um, on the support side. So for optimizations, in order for them to happen, it definitely involves two teams and a lot of brands. One would be their product or development team and the other the marketing team. Um, so the, the uploading of a lot of the content that we want in the store sometimes requires the development team to get involved. So really finding the cadence between how development teams are rolling out their app updates and the marketing team trying to get their new descriptions and keywords implemented kind of need a match. Um, so that has been the most uh, difficult aspect of that. But the important part of that is if you wait too long for these keywords that you want to immediately want to optimize, um, the impact of that, you do lose some sort of impact there. So the timing is kind of key in that situation. I mean, it sounds like it, right? I mean, if we're seeing that there's seasonality to keywords, then timeliness is, is critical. So that makes sense. Um, and sticking with you maybe for the next question, Peter, just curious if in your experience, you know, outside of what we've talked about, is there any app store optimization elements that are commonly overlooked by brands um, that you've kind of seen work or have business impact? Yeah, so I think we did briefly mention that earlier is the rating and reviews um, and understanding the sentiment. So this is one area that we're currently exploring and essentially what you could do is look at all the ratings and reviews that have been left by your users um, and the tools that we use can split the ratings and reviews into sentiment. So you have positive sentiment and negative sentiment reviews. Um, for the negative sentiment reviews, you dive in and you see where the reviews are kind of coming from. Is it a UX issue? Is there bugs? Um, is there some feature that users don't like? And essentially what you can do with them is segment it out and deliver that to the product team and hopefully they can start evolving, to that, evolving the app to become a little bit more helpful to the users. Um, for the positive sentiment reviews, you can look, start looking for keywords that are specifically mentioned. Um, so for the keywords that are mentioned, people like certain products uh, or the feature of the products, you can take that and start using it for keywords and also making sure that it's mentioned within the creatives as well. So it does resonate um, with the users when they do land on it. Insightful stuff, thank you for that. Okay, now uh, probably the topic that's on everybody's mind, right? With the uh, launch of iOS 11, I think there's a lot of potential impact that that might have on ASO and, and how you guys approach it. So Adam, it'd be great to hear your thoughts on, on what's changing with iOS 11. Sure. So. Uh, we, we do this exercise all the time trying to think like Apple and uh, Apple, in a, I mean, in my opinion at least, they, they care a lot about the consumer, the person that buys the device. And for one thing that they really care for is making sure that we all, as people that download apps, download something that's meaningful, something that will you know, provide some kind of value, whether it's solving a problem or just pure entertainment. And the way they're going about this is helping us select what apps to download through editorial pages. So uh, right now, the home page of the App Store is uh, something called the Today page, which features a lot of editorial content and recommendations, interviews, uh, videos, how-tos. And uh, those really help us consume more information before we download something so that we're more likely to actually uh, give it some more thought uh, and then use the app because we've given, given it more thought before the actual download. Could, could be very impactful then. Bolong, what about you? What, uh, how do you guys view iOS 11 and, and how you approach ISO? Sure, I think, I think um, iOS 11, is to, the change to the App Store is, is actually very big, yeah. uh, huge. So it impacts basically the two major elements for App Store optimization. One is traffic, one is download conversion. For traffic, basically right now, it, you know, Apple simplified the traffic into two major entries. One is the featured slots right. on the homepage, and the other one is basically the search slot. So that's why we need to basically work, um, think, think around that, and basically uh, get ourselves more uh, ready for Apple to feature us with more content, better content, better app and stuff, and also, of course, you know, work with them. And the second piece is get our, our, ourselves better in the search, uh, keyword search by doing optimi optimi optimization and also like work, you know, make sure the organic and paid work together. And on the conversion side, like Adam said, there are a lot of different things you know, that are available for marketers to test into or to actually optimize. For example, video. Uh, in the past, we're not able to actually upload localized videos. So for global businesses like us, it's really hard to utilize that kind of functionality. Absolutely. So now we, 
you know, there's opportunity for us to upload localized video. We certainly want to actually be, be there and to embrace this, this change. And also there are new like subtitle uh, and also promotional text. Those are new things. So those are the opportunities we could actually use ASO to really test into it and find the right things for our customers. Yeah, and, and I'll just add that one, one of the interesting things that we're seeing uh, from a conversion perspective is that now that videos are autoplaying, we're seeing an increase in conversion. So in the past, uh, just to sort of as a result of the layout of the page, very few people ever clicked on your app preview video in the app store. It was somewhere around 2%. two percent. Uh, and the fact that these are autoplaying, uh, it really increases, well, obviously everyone's now watching it. And people that do watch video are more likely to install just because it's a more realistic simulation of what the app is going to give you and, and what it's really like. And uh, we think it's, you know, it's really a big opportunity for, for conversions. And getting video right is, is definitely a challenge, too. And uh, testing is what comes in and plays a big role there. Yeah, absolutely. Peter, uh, last but not least, you know, how, how do you view uh, the impact of iOS 11? Right, yeah, so. I think the impact's going to be actually pretty big. Um, the feed section, which Belong and Adam just mentioned, is the newest feature that's going to be added to um, the iOS experience. And essentially what that feed is, is um, new content, more engaging content. Um, before, we were only very direct um, in terms of the uh, content we were able to provide. But now we'll have more awareness type content, also consideration type content, like how-to videos, um, interviews with a developer. Um, how to actually use the app and um, additional information that the users can engage with. Um, in that sense, I think um, that's kind of changing the user behavior within the app. Um, that will start addressing a lot of more questions for the, the users as well. Um, maybe provide solutions for known unknown or unknown unknown questions where users didn't even know that certain apps existed for uh, kind of a one, one problem that they may have. Um, I think this definitely changed things for the advertisers. We could start adding a different type of ad content within that feed once that's allowed. Um, for the user, it may be more interesting because they're going to be more engaged with the platform. And for Apple, it's definitely um, a benefit because uh, it starts bringing the users back into the platform. I think a lot of the experience happens um, where uh, users kind of go to Google search to find apps. Um, they may download the app within Google Search. They may even interact it with it in the future with instant apps. But now, with Apple creating this new platform, it does create a little bit more um, balance, per se, for the app experience where there's a lot more attention from the users within the App Store. Sure. So it, it sounds like uh, I shouldn't be too afraid of iOS 11, just that we have a lot more to test now. So exciting stuff. Actually, depends. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So like one thing that is, uh, I, I think, a major concern for the, the biggest apps uh, out there is just that top charts are not, uh, there's not a tab directly into the top charts anymore. So uh, that's something that, you know, think of Facebook that has four or five apps within the top 10. Uh, the, the fact that that page isn't getting as much traffic anymore because it's sort of hidden in, in one of the tabs, uh, that's, that should be a major concern, but then there's, how many Facebooks are out there in the world? <laughs> fair, fair uh, point. I, I think that's an interesting change because in the past, I think that's a typical example of Apple actually made one element from traffic to conversion. If you think about it, in the past, the ranking or uh, your, list, your list is basically an entrance for more people to find you to discover your app. But now, they made it more prompt, they, they, they actually, they. Uh, they remove the section, but on the App Store listing page, your ranking, your um, rate is actually more prominent. So it's more, it becomes an element that customer evaluate whether I should be downloading this app or not. Right. So it's still important, but in a different, for a different reason. Very interesting, very interesting. All right, looks like we have a lot to still learn about iOS 11 and what it means. Um, well, thank you all. I think you know, we have a few minutes left. If there are any questions in the audience, we'd like to kind of turn it over to you guys. But happy, uh, happy to try to answer anything you guys might be thinking about. It's, oh, we got one. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming here. I'm just curious, as this process is relatively new, can you speak to the globalization of it, some of the limitations you have by market, and if the strategy changes by market at all? Good question. Yeah, um, yeah, I can answer that. Well, the tools that, I mean, if you think about it, like the industry itself, it's been around for a while, but in terms of a maturation of it, it's only been happening in the last two years. So 
Um, I think a lot of the tools that we still use, especially for like keyword um, optimizations and research, it is definitely limited in certain regions. Of course, in the US, there's a lot of data that we can lean on, tools do lean on it as well. But take, for example, MEA in the Middle East, it's a, lo a little bit more difficult for us to get keyword information. So um, that is a little bit of more manual process. That's where we would have to lean a little bit more on SEO data as a proxy to make those types of optimizations. Um, so that's kind of the issues that we deal with at a global level. Makes sense. Any other thoughts on that, on globalization? I think from, from our end, we, uh, we tend to actually just try to localize as much as we can. So uh, from a testing strategy perspective, we may actually have a unified testing strategy in terms of what to test first and then how we actually implement everything. But in terms of the specific things we want to test or we want to use, that totally depends on different, you know, they're, they're separate marketplaces. That's how we actually work together, like global, uh, different global marketing teams, how we actually approach this. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think from a conversion standpoint, uh, even look at Audible and the way it's used in a metropolitan area where it's usually like commute on a subway uh, or, or something of that sort. And the way it's used in other places where it's not, that's not the need. Maybe it's during the, you know, maybe it's while you're exercising at the gym. Uh, and I think that has to do with, with your region where you're at. Uh, but also like the way, the way we think about this is People in different countries also engage differently with your app, and we have a really funny example with uh, with a photo editing app in Japan. Uh, they're one of the top grossing uh, photo editing apps, and in Japan, uh, they were trying to figure out you know how to increase conversions. And in the beginning, they did the very basics of translating from English to Japanese, uh, their, their screenshots. Um, and afterwards, basically, the questions we asked was, are people in Japan using your app a bit differently? And I mean, one of the, the things that they saw was that a lot of the pictures that were being edit, edited were pictures of cats. And since that was something common, and maybe it was just a trend, but it, at the time it was common, we told them, look, why don't you put that, uh, a, an image of a cat in your first impression, which is basically the images that load first on the page above the fold. And that's something that resulted in a, in a very high increase in conversion rates. And I, I, I don't know if cats would have worked as well in, in the United States or other countries. So there's a lot of examples of uh, you know, changes that are specific to different regions. Good example. Although I think the internet loves cats. I'm pretty sure we've heard <laughs> that at this point. <laughs> uh, um, excellent. Any other questions, perhaps? Don't be shy. Yeah. I might have a question about discoverability and how that would be different for, say, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about Audible. And a very large company, I imagine. You know, obviously their presence is very well established, but especially for startup companies, how do you improve discoverability, especially with so many large companies out there devoting time and resources to optimization? Do you have any kind of interesting tips on you know, what might uh, take a new app even, um, what might help them get up in the ranking? Because um, I think in the past, the things changed much quicker, and now it seems that things are more established in terms of the ranking in the app store. You know, how, how do you deal with that as a startup? Yeah, I think we've dealt with that in the past before for a new app. Um, I think the iOS updates definitely try to address it so that new developers that don't have a major presence definitely have an, an equal, equaler, if that's the word, um, playing ground. Um, it's harder to use brand names. Of course, there is no recognition for startups, so it's very important to figure out what product features are resonating with users in the major competitors, so you do are mentioning that. Um, it's also very important to put a little bit of paid effort behind to it so you do kind of increase in rank for certain terms. Um, but I do still think it's kind of difficult for developers to kind of break into the rankings if they don't have a phenomenal product and that's not something that Apple definitely is trying to address. Um, yeah, that's what I would do is really lean on product uh, type keywords, uh, feature type keywords, try to build out f as many phrases with those keywords as possible. Um, Maybe cats, yeah, <laughs> with seasonality trends. Um, that's pretty much, I think, yeah. the best you can do with uh, startups. I think one thing I want to call out is basically how you actually look at the App Store. 
um, it is a traffic source, but also I think it's more important that it's a, it's a conversion surface. So you have to think about this more holistically with your other marketing channels, because if you think about it, a lot of the other marketing channels, you can direct the traffic to your app store, and then that becomes a, you know, a place people can actually discover more about your service, your app, and then convert into the next stage. Of course, you can actually drive organic traffic within the app store itself, but for startups, I think it, it is going to be very hard to just rely on the organic traffic in the App Store to actually break through. Yeah, I, th I think uh, Apple, the fact that they, you know, they hired uh, a really big team of editors, people that you know, handpick apps, and it does increase the chances of a company getting featured. Um, and I think it boils down to innovation. Uh, at the end of the day, any startup, if they don't innovate and if they're not doing something that's truly unique that you'd want to tell your friends about, um, and also from a creative standpoint, just doing things that others haven't done in the way they present themselves and the way they market themselves, um, they, they won't succeed. And if they do know how to package those things together, uh, then you know, approaching Apple, who knows, you know, maybe they will feature you and that's something uh, you should at least be trying to do. Well, on that note, we are sadly out of time, but uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. I found it really insightful. Audience, I hope you did too. I want to thank my panelists one last time. Thanks so much, guys, for educating me on ASO. But I uh, hope to see you guys out of that week. Thank you. Thank you.